Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so for those of you who were there last week, uh, you may remember that uh, we discussed uh, shortly what uh, Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity has to, to tell us. And in particular, we, we saw one important thing, which is that you need to go beyond a Newton's theory of gravity and to have a relativistic description of gravity whenever your, your physical system which has say, a mass m and a typical size r, is such that its compactness parameter, which is given by this ratio here, is of order one. And so typically, when you deal with neutron stars or black hole, this compactness parameter is of order one, and you need to use general relativity. We then uh, introduced uh, gravitational waves, and we saw that gravitational waves are nothing but uh, tiny ripples in the curvature of space-time that propagate at the speed of light. So gravitational waves pro propagate at the same speed as electromagnetic waves, and there are some similarities between the two, but we mostly saw that there are many differences between electromagnetic waves and uh, gravitational waves, and that these make complementary sources of information about the universe. We didn't have time to discuss gravitational wave sources, so this is what I'm going to uh, start with today. Today we're going to uh, see that a good source of gravitational waves has not only to be massive, but also compact, in the sense that this number it will be large, and relativistic, in the sense that the typical velocities of the source will be close to the speed of light. So that's going to be the, the first uh, point today. And then we will move on to the topic of uh, gravitational wave detection. We will see that we already have detectors that try to see those gravitational waves. We have plans for future detectors, in particular in space. And we will uh, finish, of course, by uh, a discussion of the first gravitational wave observations that took place uh, last fall, the 14th of September and the 26th of December. Uh, like I said uh, last week, please stop me anytime if you have a question. If, if there's something I'm saying that is not clear, stop me and ask me a question uh, to make sure that uh, you, you, you're following what I'm saying. So let's... Uh, start with uh, the topic of uh, gravitational wave uh, sources. So let's ask ourselves how are gravitational waves uh, generated? And typically the question we want to address is given some gravitational wave source, right, that I'm going to schematically draw like this, what is the typical amplitude that I will denote h of the gravitational wave that is sourced here at a certain distance d. So that's one interesting question we want to address. What is the typical amplitude of the gravitational wave for a given source? And the second question is, this wave is you know, radiating, sorry, this source is radiating gravitational wave with a certain gravitational luminosity, that is to say, the energy flux in gravitational wave and so the second question we want to address is how is this flux of energy that goes in gravitational waves related to the properties of the source? So those calculations we're going to do are fairly uh, qualitative or semi-quantitative. I will uh, basically uh, skip all of the technical pieces and uh, characterize my source uh, as uh, having a certain mass m and a certain characteristic size r. Another important quantity that will play a key role here is something called the quadrupole moment of the source, q. We will see in a second that a good source of gravitational wave has to have some time varying quadrupole moment. So for those of you who don't remember what a quadrupole moment is, very precisely the quadrupole moment is given by the integral, well, it can depend on time. It's given by the integral over the source of the mass density that depends on time and on where you are in the source. And then you have xi xj minus one third of norm of x squared delta ij. So in other words, the quadrupole moment is nothing but the trace-free part of the moment of inertia of the source. And as an order of magnitude, you can see already that that scales like the mass and the typical size squared, because you know this x here varies over the size of the body. So you're going to pick two of those, and then you integrate the mass density, you get the mass. 
So as an order of magnitude, it goes like m r squared. But it can change with time. Of, for instance, if you have two stars orbiting around each other, the quadrupole moment varies with time. So I will be able, in particular, to take you know, time derivatives of this quadrupole moment. And that would basically scale like omega times the quadrupole moment if omega is the angular velocity of the orbit. Right? The typical time scale of variation is the inverse of the orbit, orbital uh, period. So that means I'm going to look at a source which has some internal dynamics. In particular, it can have some internal velocity v, a characteristic velocity. This velocity, roughly, this is going to be 2, two pi r over t, where t is a characteristic time scale of evolution of the source. And as, again, if my source is a binary system of black holes, for instance, 2 pi over t is the angular velocity, t is the period of the orbit, so this is you know, omega times r. This is the same omega that will come in when I take a time derivative of the quadrupole moment. Good. So now, we ask ourselves, how, is, how are those properties of the source, mass, uh, size, quadrupole moment, typical velocity, related to the uh, amplitude of the gravitational wave at a distance d? And for this, you need to, uh, to trust me, uh, because it would take a, a couple more colloquium to actually uh, derive the formula. But remember, you have some formula that is like a D'Alembertian operator on this gravitational wave amplitude h that is sourced by the stress energy matter of tensor. That's what we saw last week. So it looks a bit like the standard formula for you know, the propagation of uh, an electromagnetic field sourced by some uh, current, OK? Uh, so you know you can solve this using a, a retarded uh, solution. You're going to have some uh, uh, um, retarded uh, kind of uh, uh, integrals that involve the retarded time because the information propagates at a finite speed. And so then you can do a lot of algebraic manipulation, and you end up with this formula, which is called Einstein's quadrupole formula. So of course, it evolves g and c, because this is general relativity, right? So it's gravity and relativity. Uh, the amplitude of the waves is inversely proportional to the uh, distance to the source. And then you have two times derivative of this quadrupole moment. So you need your source to have a time varying quadrupole moment to have some gravitational wave emission. And if you want to be more precise, Actually, the gravitational wave itself you know, is a tensor. You would have two indices here, ij. It's like a 3 by 3 matrix, just like the quadrupole moment is uh, a 3 by 3 matrix. And you actually have this formula that holds only in a specific gauge, a so-called transverse traceless gauge. So you would add some tt indices here. And when you evaluate h at time t, it's related to the properties of the source at the retarded time t minus r, because gravitational waves propagate at the speed of light. But these are just technical details. Basically, what matters is this is how it scales. And what you can do is relate this to those properties here of the source. As an order of magnitude, this is going to be 2j over c to the 4d. And then 2 times the derivative of the quadrupole moment, you're going to pick up 2 powers of omega. and as an order of magnitude, q is like m r squared. OK? So that's the first formula. The second formula, which is also unfortunately called Einstein's quadrupole formula, there are two of them, uh, relates now the properties of the source to the gravitational wave luminosity, the total amount of energy that goes into gravitational wave per unit time. And that's given by g over 5, c to the 5. And then you have 3 times derivative of the quadrupole squared, which as an order of magnitude is like g over 5, c to the 5, omega uh, to the 6, m squared, or to the 4th. Okay. 
Yes? L is the gravitational luminosity, that is, the energy flux that goes into gravitational waves. Yes? L zero. Sorry? I could imagine having H non-zero if the second derivative is non-zero, but the third derivative could be zero. Well, so there's some problems. Uh, so this is, if you want to be more precise, you would have, you know, Qij triple dot uh, times Qij triple dot, and you have a sum over the indices. And if you take, for instance, a binary system of point mass, you can explicitly compute the quadrupole moment. It depends on time. The, two, the, the, the first, second, third derivatives are all non-zero, and, and they give you explicit expressions here for those uh, formulas. I'm just, I'm just worried about not understanding something. In, in, in the electromagnetic like the H is like the dipolar radiation. I was about, the yes, I was about to, to say that. It's somewhat related to the square of H. Yes. It's related to the square of the derivative of H in, in general relativity. Yes, but I could imagine that the derivative of H is zero. Imagine a situation like that. In which case, I could have. So you mean a constant H? Right. So I could. I would have. I would have. But then it's not. That, it's, it's, not a wave then it's not a wave then because it doesn't oscillate if the time derivative is zero. So. Since you, you point out that it looks a little bit like what we know from electromagnetism, that's something I wanted to say. This formula in particular looks a lot like Larmor's formula, right? If you imagine that you have some uh, distribution of charges and you accelerate them, you're going to have some dipole moment that evolves in time. And you have an, a luminosity, an electromagnetic luminosity, which, uh, if I remember correctly, is given by two-thirds 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, 1 over c cube. And then you have the dipole moment with 2 times derivative. Well, it's a vector, right? There's a, there's a little index i, and you square it. So what are the differences? Well, basically, you know, there is this analogy between Newtonian gravity and, um, I mean, the Newtonian Newtonian law of universal gravitation and ele electrostatics, where you can replace the constant of the coupling constant g by one over four pi epsilon naught, and then you replace, you know, the dipole in electromagnetism by the quadrupole. So why is that? Why why don't we have, for instance, dipolar gravitational radiation? So maybe the first question to ask is why don't we have monopolar? Uh, electromagnetic radiation. And that's because the electric charge is conserved. Okay? That's why the electromagnetic radiation is predominantly dipolar. In gravitation, mass energy is conserved, so you don't have monopolar radiation. But while the dipole moment is not necessarily conserved, the linear momentum is conserved in gravity. And so you can't have dipolar gravitational radiation. So the leading order radiation appears at quadrupolar order. So this is why here we have this quadrupole moment that comes in. Good. Uh, so that was just a little parenthesis. Actually, I don't need to keep it. Now I want to ask myself, how can I maximize the energy output in gravitational wave and the amplitude of the gravitational waves for this source? Well, I can just rewrite that formula in the form uh, 2G. Mm, I'm going to make a mistake if I just try to do it like that, so I'm going to take my notes. So I can replace omega by V over R, and then I will get 2R over D, V over C squared, GM over C squared D. Yeah. And what you recognize here is the compactness of the source. Similarly, here I can replace omega by V over R and do a little massaging. Sorry? So here if I replace omega by V over R, the R squared cancel. But then I introduce one. Thank you. 
I introduce one here and so one here. Uh, similarly, here I can replace omega by v over c, and so I get c to the 5 over 5g, v over c to the 6, gm over c squared or squared. So what you see here right away is that if I want to maximize the energy output in gravitational waves, I need a compact source in the sense that this compactness parameter is close to 1, and a relativistic source. Okay? And if it's compact and relativistic, those two things here are of order 1, and R is of order gm over c squared. So I get that formula. Well, I'm going to say something like that and that formula. So that's whenever V is of order C and R is a bit larger than the gravitational radius GM over C squared. That is to say when the source is relativistic and compact. Why, yes? Why two here on the V is equal to one? Sorry? Of order one. Yes, but two uh, over d, no. No, but I, I also said that gm over c squared r is of order one. So r is, or is of order gm over c squared, which I replace uh, here. OK, so if I'm in a situation when my source is compact and relativistic and massive, I will get the maximum energy output and the largest amplitude for the gravitational wave. So you can do a, actually a numerical evaluation of that, and you find that it's of order 10 to the 52 uh, watts. That is to say, a thousand times larger than the sum of the luminosities of all of the stars in the visible universe in visible light. So in the best case scenario, this is the most energy, ener I mean, powerful phenomenon you can think of. Okay? The coalescence of two compact objects, like two black holes, for instance. So this is really a, an upper limit, okay? And then you can estimate what this is. For instance, uh, if you take a 60 solar mass source and you put it at a distance of 400 megaparsec, so uh, a, a megaparsec is a million of a, par a million times a, a million parsec, and a parsec is about 3.2 light years, and a light year is the distance traveled by light in a year. These are units very convenient for astronomers. And 400 megaparsec is sort of, you know, pretty much out of our galaxy, but still not so far out there. Cosmology, I mean, the size of the universe is more like, of the observable universe is more like 16 uh, gigaparsecs. So you still have space. And then you will get 10 to the minus 20 if you put uh, 60 solar masses and and a distance of 400 megaparsec. So of course, I've not chosen those numbers by chance. These turn out to be roughly the properties of the first gravitational wave even ever detected. H is the amplitude of the gravitational wave, and it's dimensionless. It has no dimensions. We're going to see when we talk about gravitational wave detection that the effect of a gravitational wave is to induce a strain, a relative change in distance. So this is dimensionless. And it's a very tiny number, as you can see. OK, I think that's all I wanted to say here. Do you have any questions uh, about this? No? It's good? So that was one important question we, we, we asked ourselves, right? What is the typical amplitude of the gravitational wave you expect for an astrophysical source, in particular in the best case scenario? We saw that the best case scenario is a massive, relativistic, and compact source. Another important question, of course, is was, what is the typical, gravi the, the, the typical frequency of the gravitational waves emitted by a given source? So let's do that. Let's compute that. So we are interested in 
in powerful, promising sources of gravitational waves. So we want a time-varying quadrupole, we want high velocities, we want a compact source and a massive source. So you may say, let's just take a black hole. A black hole is massive, right? It comes from a star. It's compact. It's the most compact object you can think of. It's relativistic because if I perturb it, it's going to react very quickly. Uh, and you have to be careful the way you perturb it because if you perturb it in a spherically symmetric manner, there's no time-varying quadrupole, so there's not going to be any gravitational wave emission. You have to perturb it in a non-spherical manner in a way where there is some time-varying quadrupole moment. So nature provides us with a very nice uh, source of time-varying quadrupole moment, and that's if you have two stars orbiting each other, in particular if you have two black holes orbiting each other. Now you're going to have a time-varying quadrupole moment, and if you have two black holes, they are compact, they can get very close to each other, because they are small, even though they are massive, and that will mean also the gravitational field is going to be very strong, the orbital velocity is going to be relativistic. So let's, let's see what kind of gravitational wave frequency comes out of this. Oh. So we take two stars, or two black holes, two neutron stars, mass m1, mass m2, semi-major axis A, they orbit around each other, typical angular velocity omega, and, well, we, we're just going to do some simple order of magnitude calculations again, so we're going to use Newtonian gravity. Kepler's third law tells us that gm is omega squared a cubed. Well, capital M is the total mass, m1 plus m2. Okay? So that is to say the source is self-gravitating. On the other hand, we said we want it to be relativistic. We want the typical velocity to be close to the speed of light. The typical velocity is omega, the angular velocity, times the size, a, and we want this to be of order c. Okay? That's one of the conditions to have a powerful gravitational wave source. So you can very easily convince yourself by just substituting this omega, which is c over a in here, that a has to be typically a bit larger than gm over c squared. That is to say, it's a compact source. That makes perfect sense, right? If you, your two bodies are closer to each other, the angular velocity is larger, and so if you want it to be relativistic, you need those bodies to be very close to each other, so you need it to be compact, because if you take two suns, they will never get to orbit around each other at the, at the speed of light because they're going to collide way before they are close enough. So this is why you need your source to be compact, to be both compact and relativistic. So now, and once again, you're going to have to believe me, but that's pretty intuitive. If you're interested in the frequency of your gravitational waves, A, at the, at so in the case of uh, uh, exactly. the two black holes that merge, so A evolves, right, from fairly large separation to roughly, uh, you know, the, the size of, of the system when they touch. So here I'm saying I need, oh, okay. So what you get here if you take 60 solar masses is roughly uh, 200, 300 kilometers. Because you have two, say, two 30 solar mass uh, black hole, right? Uh, a 30 solar mass black hole has a radius of uh, 100 kilometer, and here they're going to end up, you know, basically orbiting around each other up to the point where they merge, and the, the orbital velocity is going to be, you know, a fraction of the speed of light right at the end, and so the total size is, is the size of the, you know, binary, and so it's roughly a, a few hundred kilometers. So now we're interested in the frequency of the gravitational waves emitted when those two black holes orbit each other. So the frequency is uh, the angular frequency over 2 pi. And now I'm going to state that the angular velocity of the gravitational waves emitted is twice the angular uh, velocity of the orbit. So you may not 
understand necessarily why there's a factor of two, but certainly if I tell you, you know, the faster it goes around, the higher the frequency of the gravitational wave, that shouldn't be too surprising. Uh, you expect those two to be proportional, the angular velocity of the orbit and the, uh, uh, sorry, the angular velocity of the orbit and the angular frequency of the gravitational waves. And the factor of two comes from the fact that uh, the gravitational waves are quadrupolar in nature. So, uh, if you wish, you have sort of four lobes here. Okay? So A is a bit larger than GM over C squared. So omega is a bit less than C cubed over GM. So the frequency is a bit less than 1 over pi GM over C cubed. And what matters, what is really important, is that this frequency is basically proportional to, sorry, C cubed over GM. It's proportional to the inverse of the total mass of the system. So similarly, the gravitational wave wavelength will be proportional to the total mass. So the larger the mass, the smaller the typical frequency. And this is why when we build detectors, right, we look at different kind of sources. So on this diagram, you have the typical gravitational wave amplitude, which we just computed, you know, is going to be at best over the 10 to the minus 20, as a function of the frequency of the gravitational waves. And so if you look at frequencies, sorry, masses for your source, which are about, say, 1 or 10 or 100 solar masses, well, you can actually do the calculation. If I take, uh, say, 60 solar mass, 65 solar masses, to be more precise, I'm going to get a typical frequency a bit less than a kilohertz and a typical uh, gravitational wave wavelength uh, a bit larger than 300 kilometers. So if your, if your system ha you know, is solar mass, then the, 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 the frequency is typically you know, around the kilohertz or a bit less. And this is the sensitivity band of ground-based detectors like LIGO or Virgo, which will be sensitive to the in-spiral and coalescence of binary system of stellar mass compact objects, like two neutron stars, two black holes, or one of each, which is shown here. If now you look at much more massive sources like supermassive black holes, say 10 to the 5 solar masses, 10 to the 7 solar masses, well, the frequency is going to be much lower, right? So it's going to be, say, between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 1, or 1 hertz. And you will be looking at the coalescence of two supermassive black holes. Or like I mentioned uh, last week, the inspiral of a stellar mass compact object into a supermassive black hole. Yes? The H would be larger, absolutely. What is more important for detection? Alors, so for detection, well, it <laughs> first, Depending on the, the, the well, there's not one thing which is more important. What, what I want to say is, if you're interested in this kind of sources, you need to be sensitive here. If you're interested in this kind of sources, you need to be sensitive here. But if you want to be sensitive to those frequencies, you have to leave Earth because you have too much noise at frequencies below one hertz. You need to build a space-based gravitational wave detector, which is actually going to be huge with arms of order of few uh, million kilometers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to that. And what indeed is remarkable is that the amplitude of the wave is, you know, scales like the mass. So if the source is more massive, the amplitude is larger. So that means you can see also uh, sources which are much further away. While LIGO and Virgo will be seeing sources uh, that are, you know, at a few hundred megaparsec from us. Uh, ELISA we'll see the coalescence of binary supermassive black hole up to cosmological redshifts, like redshift of 10 or even hundreds. Basically, any coalescence of two supermassive black hole that happens in the universe, Lisa will see it. 
precisely because the amplitude of the wave is so large. Oh, ELISA is a sort of the European LISA, the evolved LISA. LISA. I, will, I, will, uh, I will talk about it in the next term. Uh, Swiss satellites, yes, that's right. Other questions? Nope. OK, so just like you have an electromagnetic spectrum, you have a gravitational wave spectrum that goes with periods that goes from, you know, milliseconds or less to basically the age of the universe. And that's going to probe different kind of sources. The more massive the source, the larger the period. From compact binaries in our galaxy or explosions of uh, stars, supernova, or isolated rotating neutron stars, the kind of sources that emit at high enough frequency that terrestrial detectors will see them, to more massive sources like supermassive black hole that a space interferometer will see. So these are binary supermassive black holes as well as uh, compact objects that can be captured by supermassive black holes. Even more supermassive black holes, like 2 times 10 to the 9 uh, solar masses, uh, timing of pulsar, pulsar timing array, with, will allow us to, to see those uh, gravitational waves. So I'm not going to enter into details here. Um, but that's another way to try to, to find the signature of gravitational waves. And uh, finally, you may also look for the imprint of gravitational waves emitted very early after the Big Bang into the cosmic microwave uh, radiation. And uh, we hope to see, for instance, gravitational waves that come from quantum fluctuation in the very early universe uh, using uh, this uh, indirect effect, or maybe also with these other um, kind of detectors. So that's all I wanted to say about the sources. Now what I want to do is to come to the question of detection, right? Say a bit more about those terrestrial interferometers and as, as well the future space interferometer. So before I, I move on, do, do you have any questions? No? So we saw that the typical you know, gravitational wave amplitude is like 10 to the minus 20 or 10 to the minus 21. And so if you look into your data, for instance, here you have some noise realization, right? In some detector, I'm going to talk about the detectors in, in a minute. You have some noise realization here, and you have some little signal here, which is buried in there. So I have to multiply by, sorry, by 100 to sort of see it come you know, at the level of the noise. 10 to the minus 21 times 100, that's 10 to the minus 19. So that would be the in spiral of two neutron stars, for example. So if you used to look for a signal in data, you know that you have some big trouble here, right? Your, your signal is completely buried into the noise. Despite the fact that your detector is exquisitely sensitive still, you can't see the signal because it's completely buried into the noise. So the only way you can extract that signal is if you know exactly what you're looking for. And that's the theoretical challenge about gravitational wave detection. That is to say, you need to know very precisely what you're looking for so that you can cross-correlate the so-called template waveform, the theoretical predicted signal, with the output of your detector. And then you integrate in time or in frequency. And if your signal, your template, is in phase with a signal that is in the data, you're going to build up progressively signal-to-noise ratio. You're going to filter out the noise and recover the signal. If, if you filter, you have no signal above uh, one kilohertz. So, so if you, you have a lot of noise at high frequency, so mm -hmm. you are mixing, making your life difficult. Sorry, I didn't understand what you meant. Well, the spectrum of the two signals are very different. Of which signals? Well, the blue and the red one that you have there. Yeah, so the, the, so the typical frequency range that's going to be spanned by uh, uh, this, the signal, is say from, well, basically from Let's, let's say 10 to the minus 5 hertz to a few kilohertz when the merger happens. But your, your, your detector is sensitive enough only in a much broader range, like between 10 hertz and a few kilohertz. Okay, so you're going to start potentially being able to see something only once the signal comes into your sensitivity band. And then what you do is you, you take in Fourier space your, your template, you correlate it with the Fourier transform of the signal. You normalize by the power spectral density because you're not sensitive 
the same way at different frequencies, and you integrate in frequency space. And you can show that this is the optimal way to get some uh, detection. This is going to give you a detection statistic, mm -hmm. signal to noise ratio, that can be very large if indeed your uh, template perfectly matches the signal which is buried in the noise. This is a very standard thing that has been used uh, in that field for, for a long time. In fact, you correlate the experimental signal with the theoretical one. Exactly. So this is why there is this theoretical challenge, that is, the challenge is to solve the Einstein equation to pre very precisely predict the orbital motion and the wave emission from those binary system of compact objects. And then you use those templates and you cross-correlate against the data. So I'm, I'm saying this because basically this is most of my research. Uh, and so I just want to say this is something that is very important to do. You need to solve the Einstein equation for those kind of sources and predict very accurately, especially the phasing of the wave, so that then you can look for it in the data and try to extract uh, the signal if it's there. So there are many methods to do that. I won't uh, discuss them. Just want to now discuss gravitational wave detectors because time is flying. So to understand how you can detect a gravitational wave, you need to know how a gravitational wave is going to interact with matter. So imagine that you have uh, a monochromatic gravitational wave right, with a typical amplitude h here as a function of time with a period t, so it repeats itself. And let's imagine that it's crossing, uh, I mean, it's traveling in a direction perpendicular to the screen. Imagine that in that screen you have a ring of freely uh, falling uh, particles. They, they, they feel no force, they're just all freely falling, say, in space, for instance. So what's going to happen is that as the gravitational wave propagates, it's going to uh, alternatively compress and um, and um, expand, thank you, the uh, directions perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So after a quarter of a period, you know, one direction is compressed and the other one expanded, and after another half period, it's the other way around. So you have this oscillation like this, okay, that repeats itself if the wave is monochromatic. In fact, you have two polarizations in a gravitational wave, just like actually electromagnetic waves, two polarizations in states. One which we call H plus because, you know, it sort of looks like a cross as, as the effect as time accumulates. And the other one is called H uh, cross and not H plus because it's basically the same pattern but rotated by 45 degrees. And the, the most generic gravitational wave would be a linear superposition of those two polarization states. The key point here, if there's one thing to remember, is that if H is a typical amplitude of the gravitational wave, the change induced here by the passing gravitational wave, delta L, is proportional to the amplitude of the gravitational wave and proportional to the initial size of your detector. Okay? So for instance, let's imagine that you have here your detector, let's imagine you have two arms there, okay? with a typical size of a kilometer. Now imagine that nature sent you a gravitational wave with an amplitude which is great for you. It's the maximum you can hope. It's 10 to the minus 21. So what is the change in length induced by that gravitational wave? It's 10 to the minus 21 times a kilometer. So it's 10 to the minus 18 meter. It's a millionth of a millionth of a micrometer. Right? The micrometer is the size of a bacteria. A millionth of a micrometer is a hundredth of the size of an atom. And so 10 to the minus 18 meter is a thousand of the time of an atomic nucleus, right? This is the kind of change in length induced by a passing gravitational wave that you need to be able to detect. This is a challenge. And this is a challenge that has recently been met by people who built those detectors. So those detectors are essentially kilometer long Michelson interferometers. There are two of them in the US called LIGO, uh, two in Europe, one which is a Franco-Italian collaboration called Virgo, and uh, one which is in collaboration between Germany and, uh, and uh, the UK, and maybe, I think a few other countries called GEO. The size of the arms here are four kilometers for the American detectors, 
3 kilometers for Virgo and 600 meters for the, the smaller geodetector. So what happens is as the gravitational wave comes, say, from the sky, right, it's going to reduce the size of one arm and increase the size of the other, and alternatively. And that's going to change the interference pattern at the output on your photodetector. It's changing the optical path of photons. And so this differential, uh, this, this difference in, in the optical path between the two arms is going to translate in a change in the uh, interference uh, figure, okay? which you will see on your photodetector. So this is how it works. It's a bit more complicated in practice, right? but you know, it's essentially the idea. You have a laser source, a beam splitter, so the light goes into both arms, is recombined after uh, having been reflected by those exquisitely reflective mirrors. And then you have your photodetector here. And there are actually more uh, optical components in there. You have, in particular, two more uh, mirrors, in, one in each cavity, so that you have some Fabry-Perot cavities here with very high finesse, which effectively increases the uh, optical pass by a factor 300 or so. So effectively, it's as if you have the detector which was with arms that was like a thousand kilometer instead of a few kilometer. Um, so that's one trick that allows you to be more sensitive. Uh, there are many other tricks. Uh, the, the, the real thing is way more complicated than this, but this is the basic schematics of the instrument. And this is the most sensitive measurement, I mean instrument, to measure something ever built by human beings. It's now capable to measure relative uh, changes in distance of the order of 10 to minus uh, 22 or so. These are actual sensitivity curves of the actual detectors that were operated between 2000 and 2010. Uh, so this is the sensitivity to, to your gravitational wave as a function of frequency. And you can see, you know, in dashed uh, uh, magenta here, the design sensitivity for the European Virgo detector. And you can see that the actual uh, sensitivity that is realized is, is, is on the design. Same with the American LIGO detectors. So those are the detectors that have taken data between the year 2000 and 2010, so-called first-generation detectors. They were already exquisitely sensitive, but they didn't see anything. And we didn't expect them to see anything because the predicted even rates were too low. We would have had to be quite lucky to see something. But it was already planned in the 90s that that was not the end of the game. They, would, they were supposed to stop in 2010 and upgrade so that they could improve the sensitivity by a factor of 10 in order to be 10 times more sensitive by the end of this decade. In 2020, we should have advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo, which will be 10 times more sensitive than first generation detectors. So here are the two LIGO detectors. Here is Virgo, here is Geo. One of the LIGO detectors, actually there were two of them in, uh, in just one uh, cavity, but one has been completely uh, dismantled and moved to India. Indians should have their own detectors operated thanks to, I mean, by Indian people, but with uh, American uh, technology. And the Japanese are building their own second generation detector called Kagra in the Kamioka mine currently. And so the idea is that those second generations will be 10 times more sensitive. So that's, that means they are able to reach signals that are potentially 10 times further. They have access to, to a volume of universe which is a thousand times larger. Okay? So that means that the even rate, because it's you know, radius to the cube for the volume. So that means that the even rate you expect is a thousand times larger. And with a, 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 an even rate a thousand times larger, now you do expect to see quite a few events per year. So you've heard that you know, last fall, after just uh, th three months of taking data with a sensitivity that was increased by a factor of two or three with respect to initial LIGO, LIGO already saw some signals. So we think that by 2020, when we'll have reached design sensitivity, we will see roughly one coalescence of supermassive black hole every day or every two days. And we expect to see other kind of sources. So this is the roadmap for those advanced detectors, you know, LIGO here and Virgo here. And you can see that, you know, you go from 2015 to 2019 or 20, 
to, to reach your design sensitivity. It's not something you do, you know, like that. You don't get a factor of 10 uh, uh, and, and, and you're done. You, you progressively increase the sensitivity in different frequency ranges and, and, and try to understand your detector at every stage. So no need to look at all those things here. The only important thing is that the number of binary neutron star detection expected, well, last year was, you know, very unlikely from, you know, 10 to the minus 4 to maybe a few if we were lucky. But by the end of the decade, we should see between 1 and 2, 200 events per, per year for coalescence of neutron stars. So we're not only going to see coalescence of black holes, we're also going to see coalescence of neutron stars, which will be very important maybe to learn about the equation of state of, of matter at supranuclear densities, like I mentioned last week. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes to discuss plans for a future gravitational wave detector in space. So this is a project that had been called LISA for a long time. It was a collaboration between NASA and ESA. And in 2011, NASA said, we don't have any money anymore. We are backing out. And Lisa, uh, sorry, ESA, the European Space Agency, said, well, we still want to do it. So they changed the name and they looked for a way to do some sort of cheaper mission, maybe by reducing a little bit the, uh, the well, the quality of, uh, of, of, for instance, uh, the, the size of the arms and so on. But so here's the idea. You, you have a Michelson interferometer in space with arms uh, which are of the, between you know, one and, and three million kilometers. And each of those uh, satellites here is following an orbit behind the Earth around the sun. And uh, the frequency range for which you are sensitive with such an instrument is between 10 to the minus 4 and, and 1 hertz. And so, like I mentioned, you're now sensitive to much more massive sources, in particular involving supermassive black holes. So the good news is that uh, ESA has selected uh, for its third uh, large class mission a science theme that is called the gravitational universe. But basically, the gravitational universe, you know, the mission that's behind it is ELISA. And so if everything goes according to plan, it should be launched before I retire, 2034. Uh, people are so excited by the recent detection of gravitational wave by LIGO that like big shot at ESA or even saying we're going to try to do it even earlier, maybe 2030. And there was another very good piece of news uh, recently in, uh, in June, if I remember correctly. And that is that uh, there's a technological demonstrator called LISA Pathfinder, which is not, you know, LISA, it's just one spacecraft whose goal was to show that a lot of the new technology we need to develop to have a LISA, actually that technology, we have it. So LISA Pathfinder was uh, sent to the uh, Lagrange point L1 and it did its measurements, in particular it was supposed to show that you can very accurately track the relative motion of two freely falling masses in space and the results were beyond expectations. Orders of magnitude beyond the requirements that were set for Pathfinder. And actually, Pathfinder was more sensitive than what is needed for LISA itself over part of the frequency range and roughly at the needed uh, sensitivity for the lower frequency range. So this is very good news for future uh, gravitational wave antenna in space. Yes? A laser of uh, 30 kilowatt between the two satellites? No. <laughs> no. Basically, you, you have a, a laser which is way less powerful than uh, on the ground. Uh, what happens is, uh, so you shoot your, your, your laser, you, you need travel, it travels through a couple million kilometers, and you collect only a couple of photons on the other hand. <laughs> and I'm no specialist at all about how it works, but my understanding is somehow with uh, something that is called a reference phase. You are able to monitor the distance between the two spacecraft uh, and do interferometry the usual way, but with te optical techniques, interferometry techniques that I, I don't know. And I couldn't tell you exactly how they do it. But certainly you have much less power and you don't you know, reflect the beam back and forth. That's not how you do it. I mean, not with the same, you know, photons. 
you have lasers in each uh, in each uh, spacecraft. You send the beam, you receive it, you do something with it, you send another beam, and so on. Yes. 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 Absolutely, and I think there is there is a photon shot noise here at high frequency as well for for Elisa. Yeah. Okay. Are there questions about detectors? Uh, yes. If you have relative motion between the source and the detector? Yes. Yes? That could generate a noise? Mm, if you're able to track the relative motion of, I mean, if you know the relative velocity of your detector with respect to your source, I mean, you can account for that. I don't think it's a source of, an additional source of noise that causes any problem. You compare the, um, uh, the the model with uh, your uh, results, your uh, uh, Oh, experience. you mean if, uh, for instance, uh, your binary black hole system is moving away from us as it's emitting the waves. Is that what you mean? Uh, yes. So this is accounted for. For instance, now I'm going to talk about detections. And uh, the first gravitational wave detection that took place comes from the binary system of black holes that's located at the redshift of point 0.1. Uh, that means that if you have light emitted by stars where that happened, it's redshifted by uh, 0.01, sorry, it's redshifted by 1%. The gravitational waves are also redshifted by this cosmological uh, expansion, which is a sort of Doppler effect if you want to think about it this way. And, um, and this is accounted for. Precisely the, what you do is that you know the distance thanks to the amplitude of the wave, you know the cosmological expansion, you know Hubble's constant, and so you know the redshift. And, uh, and, and so in particular, the mass you measure for your system is not the mass in the reference frame, it's the mass redshifted by this cosmological expansion, by this sort of Doppler-like effect. And so you count for that to have the actual masses in the reference frame of the source. Is there, <coughs> is there a reason why you, you use uh, optical wavelength to do the interferometry? Or could you do it in the radio or any other wavelength? Um, I don't know. I know of plans to use potentially atomic interferometry. So the concept here would be quite different. So if you're just thinking about uh, Michelson interferometry, I guess it has to do with uh, the kind of uh, uh, noise sources you expect, right? At, uh, so at, at high frequency, you have short noise. At very low frequency, you have, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, seismic, noise. seismic noise, thank you. And mid frequency is like thermal noise on the detectors. So if you do a careful analysis of all those noise sources, it's gonna depend on the wavelength of the radiation you use. I've never done those calculations, but I imagine that if you were to use radio waves there, you couldn't get those kind of curves. But I couldn't tell you more. Shh. Okay, I think I have, what, maybe 10 minutes? Okay, so I'm gonna finish by talking about the gravitational wave detections. So these are the two LIGO detectors uh, as they were operating uh, last September. So this is a sensitivity curve, again, as a function of frequency. You see that they were roughly as sensitive, one and the other. One was in, uh, and still is, in uh, Hanford in uh, Washington State, the other one in Livingston. The time it takes for light to go from one to the other is about 10 milliseconds. And this is, again, you know, what it looks like, roughly. Uh, Michelson interferometer with uh, uh, fabri perot cavities. They come from the resonant frequency of all the, the series of suspension that you have to isolate the mirror from ground motion. So what you do is that you have this series of suspensions and you, you, you try to have very high quality factors so that uh, the resonant frequency is on a very uh, narrow frequency range that you can filter out. And so this is what was seen. So 
on the left, I mean, the, uh, yeah, in red here, you have the, tip, the, the amplitude of the gravitational wave, or more precisely, the relative, you have the relative change in length in the detector, which we saw is related to the gravitational wave amplitude, uh, as a function of time. So the time scale here is about 200 milliseconds, so it's very short. And you, you can see something like eight oscillations. What is very interesting is that you didn't just see this in Hanford, you also saw it in Louisiana. So if you, if you in blue here. So if you take the, the red one and you shift it by seven milliseconds, which is the time it took the gravitational wave to go from one to the other because it didn't, you know, sort of went, uh, the wave didn't, didn't come, you know, perpendicularly to, uh, to the, the direction of the two detectors, it, it came sort of like that. So it took less time to go from one than the other than the light travel time. And you also change sign, you put a minus sign because the orientation of the detectors are, are not the same. Americans are clever. Um, you get a very nice superposition of those two curves. So it looks like the two detectors saw the exact same thing. And then here you have the reconstructed signal that you can see here, and you subtract this reconstructed signal from the data output, you get something that is perfectly compatible with noise. And down there you have the frequency as a function of time, and you have this very nice so-called chirp, that is to say, a rapid increase in frequency as a function of time. So it sounds like that. It's like a bit like a, a, a bird. This is why we call it a chirp. So if, you, if, if you're not a gravitational wave scientist, you may think, well, whatever, that's maybe noise. If you're a gravitational wave scientist, you, just by eye, this looks amazing. It looks like what you would have asked for Christmas because it's a gravitational wave signal that's actually coming out of the noise. You don't even really need to do match filtering here. You really see the signal coming out of your noise. So the second signal that was seen then, the 26th of December, it was not the case. It was much less powerful and match filtering had to be used to see it. But here, you already see the signal by eye. So I'm going to play for you uh, the way it sounds. Uh, probably you've already heard that. Yeah, everybody? Because I don't know. Not everybody. OK. So what I'm going to play is a sound of the gravitational wave. Thank you. If you convert it in the audio band. I mean, sorry. If you convert the gravitational wave signal into an electric signal that you put you know, <laughs> to, to hear it, what is remarkable is that you don't need to change the frequency because the signal happened between roughly 30 hertz and uh, a few hundred hertz, and we are sensitive to that. It's just that it, we're not very sensitive. So first you're going to hear it. It's not very clear. You can hear it, but it's not, you, know, you don't hear a lot of the structure. And then it's going to be shifted to higher frequencies where our ears are more sensitive, and you will hear more this sort of chirping sound. Maybe you should. Okay, so you heard twice the real noise and then twice the, no, the, the real signal and then twice the signal at, uh, pushed at higher frequency. And so you had this you know, characteristic sound which goes like that. That's because the frequency increases with time and the amplitude as well. So, well, you may ask, how significant is that event? And of course, this is a key question that, you know, experimentalists addressed right away. And uh, what they came out with is that the signal has a significant, uh, sorry, a signal to noise ratio of about 25. And you see that uh, it is right here, one event with that signal to noise ratio, much higher and alone compared to the kind of signal to noise ratio you can accumulate by just a uh, random noise that can mimic a gravitational wave signal. And in terms of uh, uh, sigmas, if you want to think in terms of uh, Gaussian noise, uh, the significance is larger than five sigma. So according to you know, the usual criteria used by uh, a particle physicist, this is actually a detection. So this is why the LIGO-Virgo collaboration claimed a detection of a gravitational wave signal. The force alarm rate is less than one every uh, 200,000 years. The force alarm probability is less than one every five, uh, one than less, less than one over five million. 
So this is very highly significant. Yes? So for the frequency, I guess, you reduce the mass? Yes. From there, you reduce the distance? Absolutely. So I was hoping to actually do those calculations with you, but I'm not going to have the time to do so. Uh, but this is basically what you do, yeah. The, 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 the amplitude gives you access to, uh, to the distance, and the characteristic evolution of the frequency with time gives you access to something we call the chirp mass, which is not quite the total mass, but it's, it's related. Yeah. Sorry? And for this, uh, for this event, what, what is the mass at the distance? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, but uh, yeah. So what happened? First, I just want to describe sort of the, the explain the shape of the gravitational wave and, 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 and say what happened. So what happened is that you had those two, as it turns out, black holes that were in spiraling around each other. And as we saw, you know, waves were emitted, taking energy away. So the distance decreases with time. So the frequency increases with time, the orbital frequency. So the gravitational frequency increases with time. And because the two bodies get closer and closer to each other, the gravitational field is stronger. The amplitude of the gravitational waves increases. And so you have this characteristic increase in amplitude and frequency, which, which gives you this chirp. But at some point, there's no stable orbit anymore. So the two bodies plunge and merge to make one bigger black hole. That's when the typical amplitude reaches its maximum. And then if you believe general relativity, uh, the final black hole is highly distorted, highly perturbed, and it's going to uh, send a last burst of radiation so that it can reach an equilibrium state, a so-called Kerr black hole, where it will be parameterized only by its mass and spin. And th the signal you, you expect is a damped sinusoid. And if you measure the frequency and the damping time, it tells you the mass and the spin of the final black hole. And this is what you, you can do here with the last part of the signal. The typical orbital velocity went from a third of the speed of light to roughly half the speed of light. So you have to imagine right, that you're packing two times 30 solar masses in a couple hundred kilometers, and those two things are orbiting around each other uh, up to 150 times per second, so at roughly the speed of light. And in the process, you emit uh, about three solar mass of pure energy in the form of gravitational waves. And the energy output uh, at the maximum at the merger was more than uh, 10 to the 49 uh, watt. So it was more like, you know, than the luminosity of all of the stars in the universe in visible light, like we computed earlier. Definitely the most powerful event ever witnessed by uh, human beings. So why is it such a big deal? Well, it's a big deal, of course, because it's the first direct detection of gravitational waves ever, 100 years after their prediction. It's definitely the most robust proof of the existence of black hole, because all the indirect evidence we had so far was not so much related to the dynamical nature of space-time. Here you're really you know, receiving these waves that come directly from the strong field dynamics of two black holes that merged. It's a, a discovery of a binary black hole system. We didn't know for sure that such system existed. We, we thought so, but we were not sure. And it's the first ever test of GEO on a genuinely strong field, nonlinear dynamical regime, which is very different from the kind of test of GEO we can do in the solar system. Here we're really testing GEO for the first time in a regime where its predictions are so completely different from Newtonian physics. And that's where we may expect to actually see uh, differences between what nature is showing us and what GEO is predicting. So this is a very important event in the history of science. So the masses were measured to be roughly uh, uh, 29 and 36 solar masses. So the initial ma total mass of the system was 65 solar masses. The final black hole mass was estimated to be about 62 solar masses. So 65 minus 62, three solar masses radiated in pure energy in the form of gravitational waves. The efficiency of, uh, of uh, 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 thermonuclear reaction in the sun is about 1%, right? Uh, the final spin of the final black hole is about 67% of the maximum possible value. So it's a highly spinning black hole that rotates on itself about 100 times every second. Uh, the luminosity distance is about 400 megaparsec, so 1.3 giga light years. That means that even happened at a time where here on Earth uh, multicellular organisms were barely starting. Uh, 
So that was a quite long time ago. And the sky location is pretty poor. It's a huge banana in the sky because we have just two detectors roughly in the same plane, so it's very difficult to locate precisely the event. Still, confidential astronomers using radio waves, optical, infrared, X-ray, gamma ray, try to cover that area to look for some electromagnetic counterpart, and as expected, they didn't see anything because you don't really expect to see an electromagnetic counterpart when you have two black holes merging. This is the darkest kind of even you can imagine. And Unfortunately, we won't have time to compute together, I mean, uh, the distance, the masses, and so on, but we could have done it. Um, there was a second event. As you can see, the amplitude of the gravitational wave signal is much lower than the noise here, so you do need match filtering to extract the signal from the noise. Uh, and so there were two detections in three months, and one which was marginal. So I'll stop there and just give you some uh, references. If you are interested in this topic, there are many good uh, review articles, uh, even the fairly old ones from 10 years ago, and uh, some good topical books as well. And uh, also, if you're interested in the history of the field or even the sociology of a large collaboration like LIGO, there are uh, some, uh, some nice books here. So thank you for your attention. So what were the parameters of the other detections, of all the detections? So there were two detections which were highly significant, more than five sigma, and one that was borderline significant, like two sigma. So the last one, they don't claim it's a detection, they say it's an event, it's up to you to, to trust whether it's a detection or not. So the first detection is here, you know, with 36 and 29. The second actual detection, you see, uh, you know, it's roughly like a bit less than 20 solar masses and something like 13 solar masses. So the total mass of this one was lower. The distance was, was roughly the same, so the amplitude of the wave was lower because the total mass was lower. This is why it doesn't come out of the noise. And the third one, the total mass was sort of in between, and you see that the constraint is it's much lower. If you have this degeneracy here, it's because what you measure very well is a combination of the two masses, the so-called chirp mass that controls the way the frequency increases with time. To break that degeneracy, you need to have more detail in the waveform, and that's a bit harder to harder to measure, because you always have, have some, some noise. And uh, so this is why uh, you, know, you have this privileged direction here. And for the final black hole spin, oops, uh, so that's an, an mass. So that's for the first detection, 62 solar masses. For the second detection, it's uh, about a bit more than 20 solar masses. And the third one, a bit more than 35. And in all cases, you know, the spin is roughly between 0.6 and 